my name is Rick Bloodworth. This is the Common Sense Christian Channel, and today we're going to be looking at a viewer's questions concerning the worship. And the specific questions were this. What do you mean when you talk about worship? How do you worship? And why, he was asking me, do I believe that worship is, is as important as I believe it is? And so uh, the final request that he had was that these questions be answered with the Bible, which I really appreciate because when we're looking about the things that God wants us to be doing, the Bible is the final source. It's the only source that we can turn to and know that it's actually from God. And so we do want to turn to the, to the Word of God and find out how He views worship and what He expects us to do in that worship. And so uh, let's go ahead and dig into the Scriptures. I'm going to be reading uh, from the New International Version, specifically uh, a... Uh, the, the very first edition that was done of this in 1978, or the very first translation. Uh, I like the 1978 NIV, but I also think there's, an, there's a lot of other versions that are very good. I like the King James Version and the New King James Version. I really like the New American Standard Version and the update of that version. Uh, there's also an English uh, Standard Version that came out mm, maybe 15 years ago that's very good. Uh, and then the Revised Standard Version. Any one of these, I believe, are going to get you a very scholarly interpretation, translation of the Scripture. There are others as well. I'm not as familiar with all of them, but those seven that I just mentioned, I believe you're going to find are very well done. Uh, they're reliable, and you're going to get about the same thing from each one, even though they might be worded a little differently. So, in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 1, Solomon, through inspiration, in other words, God had him write these words, said this, Guard your steps when you go near the house of God. Well, this was something that was very important under the Old Testament worship. Remember, they're still under the law of Moses uh, when Solomon writes this. And so they're going to the temple, which he had actually built. They had been worshiping at the tabernacle. It was more of a temporary structure. They had used it for hundreds of years, even though it was temporary. But now there is a temple built in Jerusalem that referred to both the tabernacle and the temple as the house of God. And now they're worshiping at the house of God. And Solomon simply says, guard your steps when you go near the house of God. Well, now let's go to the New Testament. We come to a passage by, uh, uh, from Mark, the writer, but he's quoting Jesus, and it's found in Mark chapter 7 and verse 7 is where we're going to start. Uh, there's a very similar passage in the book of Matthew, uh, but it's put this way in Mark, starting in verse 7 of chapter 7. Jesus said this, These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to the traditions of men. Well, Jesus is quoting uh, from the prophet Isaiah in this particular passage, uh, but he's talking about worship uh, in general for all time, and, and he points this out. There are a lot of people who do attempt to worship God, but, but it's in vain. It's for naught. Well, why is that? Well, he says their teachings are but the rules of men. One of the reasons that it is so important to go to the Bible to find out what God expects of us in worship is because that's the only way we can know that we're getting the commands of God instead of the traditions or the rules of men. So let's go ahead and dig into the scriptures now and talk specifically about the New Testament worship. In Acts chapter 20 and verse 7, it says, On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul began talking to them. Well, there's a lot in there. I just want to kind of touch on this very first part where it talks about on the first day of the week when they were gathered to gather to break bread. Well, it appears from this passage that their focal point when they gathered together on the first day of the week was, was not only to worship God, but it was the, the primary focus was the partaking of the Lord's Supper, that breaking of bread. And, and the Lord's Supper consisted of two elements. One was unleavened bread, and the other was the fruit of the vine, the grape vine, um, also referred to as the cup. Um, and these two elements, 
the bread and the cup represented God's uh, son's body, Jesus' body, and Jesus' shed blood that, that he uh, shed on the cross so that our sins might be forgiven. And so on the first day of the week, the New Testament church was gathering together to remember the sacrifice. It reminded them of what they were there for and that they wouldn't be there had it not been for the sacrifice Christ had made for them. So they took of these two elements, the unleavened bread, which reminded them of the body of Christ that he so freely gave up for them, and also the fruit of the vine, which was symbolic of the blood that Jesus shed on our behalf so that our sins could be forgiven. Now, one of the reasons that I believe we can tell this is the focal point, this partaking of, of the uh, Lord's Supper, is this. They said that Paul was there. Well, Paul that is talking about here is referring to the Apostle Paul, and he was probably one of the most famous people of his time. And when you think about it, a lot of people, when they go to worship, they say they're going to listen to brother so-and-so speak, or this person speak, or that person speak. And sometimes, sure enough, those people are there speaking. But we ought to be going to the worship first and foremost to remember who we are and what we're doing here. There's no other uh, way better than by partaking of the Lord's Supper where it gives us a perspective. It causes us to remember the sacrifice that was made for us. So just as they gathered on the first day of the week to break bread, we too do the same thing. Uh, the second passage is 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 1. Concerning the collection of the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so do you also. On the first day of every week, each one of you is to put aside and save, as he may prosper, so that no collections be made when I come. Well, this is actually a letter being written by the Apostle Paul, and he's just reminding them that they are to give of their means on the first day of every week. So when we talk about our worship, and one of the things that we do in our worship is to give of our means as we've been prospered, uh, but we do it on the first day of every week. It's not uh, a random thing where uh, I might uh, call a special worship this week or a special worship that week uh, on any particular day. That wasn't the way that the New Testament church did it. They met together on the first day of every week. And if they ever lost their perspective, uh, on that, or if they ever failed to do that, they, they understood there was a penalty to be paid. In Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 24, here's a, it's a rather lengthy passage, but, but follow along with me if you would. The writer says, Let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. If we deliberately keep on sinning, well, what's the sin? The one he just mentioned was giving up meeting together or forsaking the assembly. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we've received a knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think a man deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified him? Remember, when we worship, we partake of the bread and the cup to remember Christ's body and his blood. Well, we might think, well, I've got the sacrifice of Christ for me, so I don't have to worship all the time because that's taken care of. But this says if you keep on sinning, by forsaking the assembly, that you trample Christ, his body, under your foot, and figuratively you're treating as an unholy thing his blood that he shed. So it becomes a very important thing. And then he goes on to say, after that, uh, and who has insulted the spirit of grace. And so a lot of us will be saying, well, I'm not going to be saved by works anyway. I'm going to be saved by grace, so it doesn't matter if I worship or not. But after he talks about making sure you don't forsake the assembly or, or fail to meet together, he says, if you keep on sinning, you're effectively trampling Christ underfoot, treating his shed blood as an unholy thing, and insulting the grace of God. So after you've removed the grace of God and the sacrifice of Christ, what do you have left? 
that's why it's so important to be worshiping on a regular basis. Now, uh, all of us have, have failed to do that at one point or another in our life, or at least likely we have. I know there was certainly a period in my younger years where when I finally got away from the house, I was really glad to not worship all the time, uh, but it's because my perspective was wrong. I wasn't thinking about who I was worshiping when I was worshiping. Instead, I was just going to church. In other words, going through the motion. It was kind of a, a Pharisaic attitude of, of, well, if I do this, uh, then I'll be saved because of my works. But that's not why we worship. We worship because God is worthy of that worship, and Christ is worthy of that worship. And one of the main focal points of that worship, if not the main focal point of the worship, is to remember the sacrifice of Christ. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, after 3,000 people were added to the church because they had obeyed uh, the Apostle Peter's command uh, to, there were several things he, he told them. He said, repent and be baptized. He told them to call upon the name of the Lord. And it says those who accepted the message or those who believed it were baptized. And we're told that those people were added to the church, about 3,000 people. And it says they devoted themselves, Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And all of these things are things that we find within the worship services. We, we study the Word of God. We read from the Scriptures. We talk about the Scriptures. Uh, we pray. Um, we have fellowship with one another. You could, could you do all those other things by yourself? And the answer is, of course you could. But God desired that we meet together as a body of Christians, as the church, so that we could encourage one another and we could fellowship with one another. Um, it's so much easier to, to be able to encourage when you're together in a group than it is just reading scriptures by yourself. And God saw that, that we needed each other. And so he called us together for a formal worship. And so this is what the New Testament church did. They really did devote themselves to these things. So, uh, what happened when they stopped worshiping for the proper reasons? In 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 17, we have this. In the following directives, I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. In other words, when they were coming together to worship, it, wasn't, it was doing harm, not good. Well, what was going on? Verse 18, in the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church... There are divisions among you, and to some extent I believe it. No doubt there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. And so, not all divisions are bad. If, if you have people that are going off in a direction that, that the Bible says you cannot go in, well, you have to not be going along with that. There have to be differences in order to show God's approval. Not in order to show I'm better than the next person, but in order to, to show that I'm trying to be obedient to God in all things. So there will be differences, but we're to try and make sure that we keep those differences to a minimum, and we're to try and make sure there's no divisions within the church. Well, what was happening at this point? Look at verse 20. When you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper you eat, for as you eat, each one of you goes ahead without waiting for anybody else. One remains hungry, another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you for this? Certainly not. Where they, they were taking this simple uh, part of worship, the, the Lord's Supper, where they were to just take a, a portion of unleavened bread and, and, and a portion of, of the cup, uh, the, the, the um, uh, fruit of the vine from the grapevine. And, and they were to remember from that, as they partook of it, Christ's body and, and Christ's shed blood. But they were apparently drinking um, uh, intoxicating beverage with what they were doing. They were making a feast of this day, and they were kind of separating out one from another. The ones that had the means to have the feast and get drunk, that's what they were doing. And then there'd be divisions with the rest. And so they were perverting the Lord's Supper in just about every area imaginable. And so as Paul's writing this, he, he reminds them of what they're there for. 
For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So this is the reason for that part of the worship. It's to remember Christ's sacrifice. It's to proclaim his death until he comes again. So the Lord's Supper is an incredibly important part of our weekly worship, our worship on the first day of the week. There are other things we do. We read uh, earlier in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, instructions on the giving on the first day of every week. But now let's look at what type of giving. Remember under the law of Moses, under the Old Testament worship, they gave a tenth uh, of their possessions. And even before that, before the law was given to Moses on Mount Sinai, under what many have referred to as the patriarchal time, they were also tithing at that point as well, where they would give a tenth. Um, Abraham, when he approached Melchizedek, uh, gave him a tenth of the spoil after he had been victorious in bringing back uh, in, in winning a victory, uh, in bringing back Lot, who had been kidnapped. Um, uh, a few years later, Isaac, um, his son, was uh, promised to give God, or Jacob, excuse me, promised to give God a tenth of everything that he had. These were way before the law of Moses. So tithing was something that was around for a long, long time. But now it's not referred to as tithing. It's no longer a, a certain percentage as, as determined uh, for everybody's behalf, it's just to be given, as we were told in 1 Corinthians 16, 2, as we've been prospered. In 2 Corinthians 9, it puts it this way, starting in verse 6. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And so here we have several elements of our giving. It's to be something we've already thought about, as we've decided in our heart. It's not to be reluctant. In other words, you're not supposed to be giving so much that you just hate giving it. Um, it's not to be under compulsion, where some church leader somewhere determines what you ought to be given. It should be freely given to God, and it should be something uh, that is a contribution with God's good in mind. There's all sorts of good things you can do with your money and that contribution should be thoughtful as far as that process goes where you're trying to put that, that money, that sacrifice you're offering on the first day of every week to where it will do the most good. And then he says God loves a cheerful giver. So you give as you've been prospered in keeping with your income, some versions will say. Uh, you don't give with reluctance, you don't give because you have to, but you're cheerful about it. So this is, the, this is one of the parts of our formal worship, is the giving. And again, that's a very private thing. People don't tell you what to give, nor do they need to know what you're giving. What is it the Bible says? Don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. It's personal, it's private. Just keep it that way and, and keep it on God's terms. Another thing they did together, when, or did when they came together to worship God on the first day of the week, was to sing. In 1 Corinthians 14, uh, verse 26, What shall we say then, brothers, when you come together, everyone has a hymn. And so they were singing when they got together. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 19, Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so sometimes we do sing uh, psalms. Uh, the 23rd Psalm has been put to music I don't know how many different times that people will sing. Um, we sing hymns, religious songs, spiritual songs, all of these songs with, with a, one purpose in mind, and that's to offer praise to God. Now there are other things that occur at that time as well. We can be exhorting one another and lifting one another up. Um, encouraging one another with the words we sing, warning one another with the words that we sing. But that was one of the things they did when they got together. And they sang with gratitude. In Colossians it says, 3 verse 16, 
Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual psalms, songs excuse me, with gratitude in your heart. So singing is a third element of worship. So far we've looked at the Lord's Supper, giving, and also singing. Uh, prayer is, is one we actually touched on. Remember when, when uh, in Corinthians it was talking about Christ instituting the Lord's Supper, it said he gave thanks for the bread. When we go back into the Gospels, we see that he also gave thanks for the cup. And so we have that prayer uh, within our worship. But there's other prayer as well. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 1. I urge then, first of all, requests, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for everyone. Well, of course, this type of prayer can be made anywhere. It doesn't have to be just within the formal worship. But this is the one of the elements of prayer that we need to have, is that we're praying for others. In Ephesians 6, verse 18, pray in the Spirit on all occasions. Again, it's not just limited to the, wor the formal worship. Pray in all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for the, for the saints. And so we have that element within our worship service, prayer. The next is preaching. Uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 13, uh, Timothy was commanded this. And Timothy was a young preacher. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to preaching and to teaching. And so we read word for word from the Bible when we get together to worship. We, we teach uh, from the words of God. We preach on that. And so all these things come together in, in our formal worship. In 2 Timothy 4 and verse 2, it says this, Preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season, correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. Well, why do we have to have preaching every time? Look at this. Why is it so necessary? Look at this. Verse 3 of 2 Timothy 4. For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. One of the reasons we continually read and teach and preach from the scriptures is because there's a lot of people that just want to go their own way. We get in a lot of arguments over doctrine. It's not the doctrine of the Bible that's the problem, is it? It's when men adjust that, when they pervert it, when they twist it, and they make it the doctrine of men. The very thing that Jesus warned against uh, when we started... Uh, uh, or in the passage that we looked at when we started all this this, this morning. Uh, let, me, let me read it again. It's found in Mark chapter 7, starting in verse 7. Uh, well, let me start in verse 6. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you, hypocrites, as it is written, These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to the traditions of men. One of the reasons it is so important for us to worship in the right way is because there are way too many people who are living by the doctrines of men and the traditions of men. Can those things creep into the worship? Well, they not only can, but they have. That's why there are so many different styles of worship uh, depending on where you worship at. Uh, you'll find people sometimes worship just for entertainment. Uh, you'll find sometimes people just go to a place where they hear what they want to hear. But when we worship God, it is for these five specific things. First, we're remembering Christ's sacrifice by taking of the Lord's Supper. Second, we are taking an opportunity to give back a little bit of what God's given to us. And again, very private. Third, we come together, we sing, we offer songs of praise to God. Fourth, we offer prayer to God, both thanksgiving to Him and requests 